been taking a look at the scarlet thread, the rose, um, <laughs> I'll get it, <laughs> the story and the scarlet thread that, that, that goes throughout the scriptures, pointing to Jesus, because we established that the Bible is not about us, the Bible is about God, and the Bible is about Jesus, and so we've been walking through Genesis, and at each point we just see God's plan and God's purpose through Jesus Christ. I want to review just a little bit before we get to uh, Moses today in the burning bush. Adam and Eve, uh, God formed them, and then they sinned, and God judged sin, and he judged sin because of his love. Remember, we talked about that. Would it be a loving God to allow sin to continue to hurt other people? No, it's because of his love that he judges sin. Then Abraham and Isaac and trusting God, and then Jacob and Esau and their family's fatal flaws. I've worked on that because I struggled with it when I preached on it. Family's fatal flaws, which the first of the family's fatal flaws was what? Favoritism. So you add that in there, and that's a tough one to say, but an important one. And then we looked at Joseph and how he forgave his brothers, and he reconciles and restores his family. That's where we're going to pick up um, in the beginning of Exodus. So we've walked all the way through Genesis in these stories. Now we're starting in the book of Exodus. And so basically what happened was is that Joseph moved his whole family into Egypt because they had all of, all of the food. He had a powerful position and he wanted to provide for all of his family. And during that time they prospered numbers wise, but just in every aspect of life. And as often happens that as generations passed and there was a new king, they forgot about Joseph. So the new king saw that the Israelites were powerful and prosperous, and he said, we've got to do something about this because if we don't, the Israelites are going to become more powerful than we are, and then, uh, meaning himself, he would lose power. And no one gives up power without bloodshed other than George Washington. And so the king saw that he needed to do something here, and so he enslaved the Israelites. But even after that, they continued to prosper. And so he devised this demonic plan to kill all of the male children, that that would stop Israel from growing. And the reason I bring all that up, because that's where we find Moses. Okay. How many grew up in Sunday school and you would have the stories? How many remember flannel graphs? Okay. A few of you here. That was before technology. Okay. And flannel graphs were these little pictures that would stick to a board. And I remember they would have the, the river for Moses. Do you remember this? And they'd have a little basket and, and they'd move them down. How many rem remember that? How many remember Moses personally? Is there anybody here? <laughs> a couple of you that do remember Moses personally. But, and then the craft for the day would be building the the little, the little thing. That's the story of Moses. And that was during this time. They forgot about Joseph. Israel had become prosperous. The new king hated that fact. And he wanted to kill the male children. Okay. And so this was the time that Moses was born and his mother said, I, I'm not going to do this. And so she developed a plan where she would make a basket and make it waterproof and would go and it's not so much float down the river, although there was part of that, but put it in the reeds. Why? Because the Pharaoh's daughter would go to the river to bathe with her attendants. And she knew that the daughter would see Moses, and that was Moses' best chance to live. Well, sure enough, that's what happened. Moses's, Moses was there. She saw him and saw that he was an Israelite child, but she had mercy on him. And who else went along? Moses' sister and said, hey, I have someone that can nurse him and help you. Who did, who did she get? Moses' mother, this is something I caught this week as I was reading it. Not only did Moses' mother get to take care of her son, she got paid for it. <laughs> Not just the payment, but the, those that were against God and trying to do everything against God's people, God has a way 
of working things out. And so she cared for Moses uh, and was, was paid for it. And so Moses grew up in the palace. I don't know if you know this, but Moses' life is basically broken into three parts. There's 40 years in the palace, 40 years in the desert, and 40 years leading God's people. All right. So he grows up in the palace for the first 40 years of his life. He's well-fed. He's well-educated. He's well-to-do because he was raised as a prince. Everything he wanted, he had. He was educated by the, the greatest scholars of the day. Everything you could possibly imagine. But deep down, he knew that he was an Israelite. And his people were being in, uh, enslaved. And they were being treated terribly, terribly. And so one day he saw one of his Israelite brothers being beaten and Moses looked around to see if anybody was watching and he killed that slave master. Well, it turns out that people were watching and saw him. And as word spread, he had to flee to the desert. So 40 years in the, the palace where everyone knew him now he was going to spend 40 years in the desert where no one knew him. But as these years were passing, God had not forgotten about his people. And can I throw this out to you today that God has not forgotten about you either? Because God never forgets. He's not forsaken you. He's not given up on you. That even though there is silence sometimes from God, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know your sufferings and your difficulties in life. So we go to the end of Exodus 2, 23 through 25. Years passed, the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, we've studied this all along the way. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. This is where, oh, come on. This is where we pick up the story of Moses, Exodus 3. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to, into the far uh, wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. So watch this. Moses was in the palace. He had everything. He killed a man and ended up in the desert where he had nothing. He had the lowest job of anyone. He wasn't even in the house doing the work. He was out in the desert raising sheep. He was a shepherd, which was the lowest job that you could possibly have. And then it turns out he didn't even own the sheep, but he was working for his father-in-law for 40 years, from the palace to the desert, working for his father-in-law, but as he led the sheep to Mount Sinai, now don't miss this, because Mount Sinai many years later would be exactly where God came to him and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. See, God in his providence and provision, he had a, watch, had a purpose and a plan for Moses' life, even though he wasn't in the palace. See, God can use us at any point in our life lives. So here's what Moses sees. Now, most of you know this story, but in verse two of chapter three of Exodus, it says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush, though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Moses says, this is amazing, he said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Now, first of all, I think that the angel of the Lord in this instance is the pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus appears before Christmas. He appears on earth as the angel of the Lord. The bush was on fire, but didn't burn up. Moses knew this was a miracle. Remember, he's in the desert, where it's dry. We're experiencing some of this, and I, I hope that you're praying for rain, and I mean that sincerely. Out of all the times that I prayed that it wouldn't rain, now I'm praying that it will rain. We woke up this morning to the sound of the fire alarms going off here at the church. Dora and I were exhausted yesterday and went to bed and slept sound, sleep with the fan on. 
Turns out that it went off at three o'clock in the morning. We didn't know till six o'clock in the morning when Dora got up and heard the things going off. The fi- I know the firemen and the fire chief, they, they both came to my house, knocked on the door, never heard them. Rang the doorbell, never heard them. Six o'clock, I come over. Uh, it was Howie Patrick, uh, friends of ours. Anyway, they, I come over and all the lights are on and the doors are unlocked at the church. So I think they're still here. Turns out they weren't. So Anthony, the fire chief that lives across the street, he texts me. We've been trying to get a hold of you. I text him. Poor guy comes over at six o'clock in the morning, and uh, my hair was fine if anybody was worried. Uh, it comes and it comes over, and we're talking. We're trying to figure out what it was. There was nothing. Something happened on the panel. There was no fire or anything like that. We have everything inspected, and everything was within the past month. Everything, but for some reason. And I said to Anthony, "How's things going with the fires?" And he said, "We really need rain." It's not going to get better until we get rain. Why is it so dangerous? Because everything around it is so dry. Here's Moses in the middle of the desert where everything else is dry, and he sees a fire. But it wasn't dangerous because God was in the middle of the fire. And he stood amazed and knew that there was a miracle happening here. Did he know the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes, because ultimately that's how God reveals himself. But God had been silent in Moses' life. God had been silent in the Israelites' life. God had been silent through their suffering. But he knew what was going on in their life. Can I just throw this out pastorally to you? It might seem that God is silent in your suffering and in whatever you're going through, but God knows what you're going through, and he's there at every step along the way. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. So the angel of the Lord appears, uh, lights this, the, 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 the bush is not burning up, but this great fire is taking place. And someone said this, God can take an insignificant bush and light it on fire and use it for his purpose. Symbolically, what was God doing? He was taking Moses who had become an insignificant bush and was about to set Moses on fire that he could accomplish God's purpose and plan. In Acts chapter two, God took the apostles that were uh, a use, they were useless at that point. And he set them on fire through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're in the upper room praying, what appeared to them? Tongues of what? See, God is able to take that which is insignificant and light it on fire and be used for his glory and for his purposes. So what does Moses hear? That's what he saw, but what did he hear? When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. At this point, watch who Moses was and what he had become. Not a prince in the palace, he had become a disgraced murderer, a lowly shepherd working for his father-in-law. He owned nothing and lived in the middle of nowhere, but God came to him and God knew his name. Here's the God that we sang about, this indescribable God that created the heavens and the earth. He knew Moses' name. Can I tell you something else? God knows your name too. He knows your address and your phone number. And I remember when God spoke to my heart and I began to realize this at 15, 16 years old. It was, I knew the Bible stories because I grew up in church, but I didn't really know God. And when I began to think of the awesomeness of God that created the heavens and the earth, that holds them all together, and yet he knew my name, Randy Sabella. He knew where I lived in Hubbard, Ohio. Have you ever been to Hubbard? Exactly. People say it's a good place to be from. But he knew my name. See, in the middle of his silence, he knows you and your suffering. And he calls Moses 
by name. And Moses replied, which is key to all of this, here I am. So then God says, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. And this is in Exodus 3, 5. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. Is the dirt holy? No, it's made holy by the presence of the Lord. The sanctuary is made holy, not because of how it's built, but that the presence of the Lord is here in our midst. And he is with us, and therefore this place is holy because God is here. God, this spotless, holy, pure, perfect uh, God with all of his glory that reflects all of his character is in the fire. And he says to Moses, don't come any closer. And the reason he says that is because everything that God is, man is not. As God is holy, we are not. As God is pure, we are not. As God has no darkness in him, we have darkness in us. There's a separation between God and man. And so God says to Moses, don't come any closer. Isn't it interesting in the fulfillment of this scarlet thread in Jesus, Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say stay away. He says, come. Come, come. What's the difference? Jesus makes the difference in all of that. But in Moses' time, he said, don't get any closer. In fact, take off your sandals. And it was an act of humility. Humble yourself in the presence of Almighty God. Act in reverence and respect of Almighty God. God goes on to say, what does Moses hear? Take off your shoes. Then God begins to speak to him. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Remember this story, all part of God's plan, all part of the scarlet thread. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said to him, I have certain, excuse me, certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile, spacious land, the land flowing with milk and honey, a land of all of the names of people we don't know. Verse nine, look, the crowd of the people or the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I have seen how harshly they are being treated by the Egyptians and how the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. So here's what God says. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one that you've heard about. I'm the one that has been worshiped. I'm the one that not only created a family, but I created the whole earth. I'm the one that's here visiting you now. It's God, the only one true God. And then God, this God, this almighty God, to reemphasize this point, had been silent to this point, but he wasn't blind to their suffering. And he says to them, I know what's been going on in Egypt. I know what's been going on, but now's the time. And God tells Moses what he is going to do. God is going to deliver the people. Now catch that, that's important. Moses wasn't going to deliver the people. God was going to deliver them. But God always chooses to use humans to accomplish his purpose and his will. He didn't send the angel of the Lord to rescue. He sent Moses You see, God uses humans to accomplish his purpose. Now, this purpose was huge, affected all of history, literally. But God chose a no one from nowhere to do something that only God can do. So Moses is overwhelmed by all of this. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh in chapter three, verse 11? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? And God answered, here's the quote, I will be with you. But what about 
I will be with you. But what about, I will be with you. But what about, I will be with you. And this is the sign that I'm the one who has sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship right here at this very mountain. You'll come back to this very mountain with all of the people and you will worship me. But Moses protested again. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, what is his name? What am I going to tell them then? What God is sending me? And God replied, I am who I am. Say this to the people, the I am has sent me to you. Moses is basically, he's hearing God and he responds with this, wait, what? Wait, what What now? God, don't you know that I've, I've failed? That I've, I've fallen and I'm also fallible? That I was in the, in the palace, but I'm not there anymore. I, I did have a position of power, but I, but I don't anymore. See, when you're failed, fallen, and fallible, you're the perfect candidate for God to use. Because watch what Jesus says in Luke 14. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those that humble themselves will be exalted. Moses said, I can't. God said, you're right. Here's the part you're missing. I can I think God has called you to do some things that you look at yourself and you look in the mirror and you see fallen, failed, and fallible. And God sees you as the perfect candidate to accomplish his will because you will give all the glory and the honor to him. We're never too fallen. We've never failed too much for God to use us. Moses said, God, I can't. And maybe you say to God sometimes, I can't. But do you carry on and say, but I know God can. I know God can. In every step and stage of my life, I have never done what God had called me to do. Never. I'd never left home. I left to go to Bible school. Okay? And again, some of you knew, some of you don't know me, some of you that know me well. I was voted in high school, you know how they vote most popular and most successful and all. I was voted most likely to never leave his mama. But I did, and at each step from youth pastoring to church planting to pastoring this church, uh, it was always I can't, I can't, but he can. And the same is true for all of you. We all have reasons why we can't, and that might all be true, but we all have a God who can. Well, what if they don't believe me? Tell them that the I am has sent you. And what that means, uh, A.W. Tozier says this in a great book, A Knowledge of the Holy, I would highly recommend. God needs no one, but when faith is present, he works through anyone. Isn't that great? God didn't need Moses. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need you. But when faith is present, he can work through us and he can work through you. The I am means God is self-existent. He's self sufficient. He needs no air. He needs no sleep. He needs no food. He is a God that neither sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't need approval. He doesn't need a landslide victory. He doesn't need the electoral college. He doesn't need the popular vote. He is God and he can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it through anyone. See, God doesn't need us, but we need him. God is not like the Egyptian false gods that he would ridicule and make fun of that we'll see when his people are released. He was and is the only true God in whom all things depend. God is is majestic in his mysteriousness. And that means this, when you can't understand God, You're in the perfect place because why would you want a God that you can understand? That means you'd be no better than God. I understand less of God now than I did when I was younger and knew it all. God is the I am. He is majestic in his mysteriousness. We'll never have God figured out. We will need all eternity and never get to the end of his marvelous, amazing grace. 
God is not a book you read and then put him on a shelf. He is the I am. God is not a class you take. God is eternal and unchangeable. He says, I am. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not getting better. He's not getting worse. He is infinitely perfect in who he is. That is the God that said, I am with you, Moses. That's all you need. That is the God that says to me, I am with you, Randy. He calls me Randy. He does not call me Pastor Sabella, but he calls me Randy. He says, I am with you, and that's all you need. And he's calling out your name to say, although we're all fallen, failed, and fallible, God God says, I am with you, and that's all you need in order to accomplish a purpose that's greater than what you can do on your own. See, if you're limiting yourself by what you can do, you're missing the greatest aspects of what only God can do. And that's what we want to move to, not just individually, but us as a church. Let's get away from what we can do. We can do this, and there are some natural things we can just do. I want to get into the realm of the supernatural, where where we're experiencing it as individuals and as a church, what only God can do. When we look back and say, how is this possible? We're fallen, failed, fallible. How is it possible? Because of the I am. Not the I was, not the I will be, but this God that is majestic in his mysteriousness comes to us in the middle of nowhere nowhere, and speaks to a no one and calls them to be part of God's purpose and plan. What a wonderful Lord and a wonderful Savior. God visited the fallen broken man in the middle of nowhere. In our online service today, Bobby was my co-host and he brought up, you know, when things are going well, we often don't listen to God. But when we're in the, in the desert and not in the palace, that's when we're more apt to humble ourselves before Almighty God and listen to him. God visited this fallen, broken man in the middle of nowhere. God called him to lead God's people out of bondage and God said I will be with you I don't know if you think like this sometimes I fall into the pattern of only remembering mistakes that I've made and not just sinful mistakes but I have this this vivid memory of me playing softball when I could still play softball and actually move I cheer now that's that's my role I I cheer, I wear the shirt, okay, and and cheer, great job. But I have this vivid memory, not of, I played softball for many years, not of all the catches that I made, it's that one that I missed. And I can still see it, I was playing left field for Flemington Assembly of God in a church softball league, and, and we played modified fast pitch, and the guy hit it and I knew it was going. And so I literally turned my back to the infield and just ran and then I peeked and I could see it coming and I put my glove out like this and it just, I just missed it. And he hit it so far that I had no chance by the time I picked it up, it was going to be a home run. You know, I never, I don't remember all the catches. But for some reason, I, I remember the mistakes. Now I don't mean this to be all about me, I'm just telling my life because this is the life I've lived. I played basketball when I was in college and they, would, they had the sound system and they would say, and now from Hubbard, Ohio, playing guard, number 22, Randy Sabella and people cheer. And I come out, boom, I, I bounced that ball right off my knee with the whole gym watching. <laughs> now I didn't make a lot of baskets, but I made enough. I made more baskets than I did hitting the ball off of my knee. My point in all of this is, Why is it sometimes we only focus on our fails? Maybe you look in the mirror, literally, figuratively, spiritually, and you only see your fails. You know, God doesn't see that in you. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, watch this about Jesus real quick. God said, I am. Tell them I am. What did Jesus say? I am. 
Chapter six, I am the bread of life. Chapter, John, chapter seven, I am the water of life. Chapter eight, I am the light of the world. Chapter nine, he reiterates that he's the light of the world by healing a blind man. Chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is God and he is everything that we need in order to accomplish whatever God has called us to do. I plead with you today to stop looking at all of your mistakes. Stop looking at yourself as failed, fallen, and fallible, and look up to see an almighty, holy God that created out everything out of nothing, that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He's your God and he sees you, watch, not as a mess, but as a masterpiece that he wants to use for his glory and for the good of others. Please step out of what you can't do and enter into what he can do through you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter where you are right now, God can use you. Now listen. He's not going to speak through a burning bush. That only happened once. But God will speak to you. How does he speak to us? Through his word. He speaks to us often through our spouse. He speaks to us through church. He speaks to us through a sermon. He speaks to us through other godly, mature believers. God still speaks. He never stops speaking. And he's speaking to you. God will lead you if you're willing to follow. God will lead you if you're willing to follow. Sometimes we hear what God wants to do and we say, no. We say, I don't want to do that, or no, I can't do that. Those are both the wrong answer. Just a little bit deeper, because I think some of you it's possible have said no to God at a point in your life and it changed the direction of things. And you look back and you say, if, if only I had said yes instead of no, how my life would be different. Can I give you some good news? God can take you where you're at today and bring you to where he wants you to be tomorrow. That's all. He's not done with you. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Joseph was arrogant. His brothers tried to kill him. See, God can take, watch, and I'm gonna close. God can take the fallen, the failed, and the fallible, and light you on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit and use you to accomplish his purpose and his plan because he can, he can, he can, he can. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.